So do you always get a pimple in the exact same spot, whether it be every month or every so often, but you know it's always in the same spot? My name is Dr. Erin Millis. I'm a board certified dermatologist. I've been in practice for almost 20 years. I raised three kids and often love to share my expertise and experience so that you can gain a better understanding of your skin and avoiding wasting money on unnecessary products or unnecessary promises by products so that you really get a choice from what makes sense for you. So follow along, subscribe now, and keep an eye out for our videos. So what you've heard is true. It's very common for people to say to me, I always get a pimple in the exact same spot. They can almost mark it with an X and they know it's always going to be there. But why is that happening? Why does it always happen in the exact same spot and what, what could we do about it? So there's not a lot of research on this, but there is this concept of what we call an acne face map. But there's three big reasons why you might come across acne in the exact same spot. The most probable cause is that there's likely a cyst underneath the surface. Now a cyst is like a marble stuck under a rug, a clogged pore under the surface with, with little to no connection to the surface. So it doesn't completely go away with each and every flare, it kind of deflates or is less perceptible, but it's still there. So every now and again, it can get irritated or inflamed, swell up, and then it kind of goes through its stages, calms down again, but it's still there. I would say that's probably the most common reason I come across for acne in the same spot consistently. The other real reason for acne in the same spot could be that there's a source of chronic irritation or friction against the skin in that spot that leads to acne coming out recurrently. There's this concept of something we call acne mechanica, which is essentially that external friction or something up against the skin can actually physically clog or block the pores we're currently in an area. So you'll see this with chin straps and helmets sometimes, that you always get acne in the same locations. And if that's the case, we can start to think through ways to avoid that irritation from aggravating it or addressing it more aggressively to reduce the chances of breakouts in those spots. And the third possibility, and this is more like a possibility that if you think through is likely, but at the same time, we don't have a lot of data to support it, is there's a good chance that acne can occur in the exact same spot consistently, maybe because there's a heavier concentration of androgen receptors on some of those cells in that area that just makes it more susceptible or sensitive to the effects of hormones in that part of your skin. And that's a tougher one because we can't really alter or change that. We can just try to be one step ahead of it and pre-plan for an event occurring. So the concept of an acne face map is a way to kind of discern, you know, what could be causing or triggering breakouts in that exact same area consistently. It's a way to kind of map out the skin and just decide what is unique about that part of the skin that's most consistently linked to triggering breakouts. The thought being, if we could identify that trigger, that maybe we can do or take some steps to avoid it or reduce the chances of breakouts in that area. It makes a lot of sense. But remember that location is only one aspect of acne. There's lots of other things to take into consideration. The other things to consideration are the types and morphology of the breakouts, meaning not every pimple is acne. Acne is one cause of pimples. Acne vulgaris is a medical diagnosis, remember, that does develop pimples based on clogged pores becoming more inflamed, but there are plenty of other reasons that you can get a pimple that's not based on clogged pores that get inflamed. So important to distinguish between the two so that you actually make sure we're talking about the same thing. We also have to consider the type of acne. Is it inflamed? Is it cystic? Is it pustular? Is it scaly? Is it scabby? Is it based around a hair follicle? Is it painful? Is it sore? There's so many other features or signs or symptoms of each and individual breakout that we always like to make sure we diagnose it correctly because if we get the diagnosis right, then it's a lot easier to treat, approach treatment appropriately so that you get your best options. So acne along the hairline, what does that usually represent? This would be acne that's really just focused around the hairline, not necessarily in even central face. It's interesting, sometimes I'll see, uh, especially adolescent boys, teenage boys, where 
hairstyles might dictate that they had their bangs over their forehead. The rest of their face looks pretty clear, but they have acne predominantly along their forehead. And of course, there's that question, was it that they grew the hair to block the acne or was the acne a result of the hair growth? And I, I really find that consistently, it's probably not even worth deciding between the two because I'd much rather you choose hairstyles that you like and reflect your sense of self-identity and forget about how breakouts play a role in there because we can treat the acne secondarily and there's no reason to go chasing different hairstyles over that because we have plenty of effective ways to treat breakouts. So acne along the hairlines, it is true, can be triggered by some hair products, but not usually your regular day-to-day -day products. This would be the thicker products. This would be the pomades, the hair gels, things that have a little bit more of a substance to them that yes, if it gets onto your skin, there is the potential for the product to directly clog your pores. We don't see a lot of that these days because I can't say that pomades or hair gels are as popular as they used to be, but sure, on certain, certain circumstances, certain hairstyles, you might see them used. And if that's the case and you find it consistently used, then sometimes what we can do to ward it off is we have some prescription products that are a little stronger to keep the pores unclogged so that you can actually be more, be able to use whatever hairstyle you want and try to figure out a way to manage the skin secondarily. The other big reason for breakouts along the hairline would be that it's not acne. Sometimes we get what's called a yeast folliculitis, piteous form folliculitis. Many social media sites will refer to it as fungal acne, which is a bit of a misnomer. However, what this really is, is not true acne. It can have lots of pimples, but again, these are what we call monomorphic papules, meaning every single bump is in the same stage of development and it appears to be consistently along the forehead along the sides of the hairline. And some people will also have it down the sides of their neck too. Chest and back is very common for it as well. If it is piteous form folliculitis, we have a variety of treatment options for that that are not even in the acne category of products. So I do think if you're experiencing sort of the whole area, the whole forehead, the whole sides of the face are really just covered in breakouts. You just feel like there's lots of what look like little goosebump types of papules or bumps almost all in the same stages of development, maybe some are inflamed. This is a good one to talk to your dermatologist about because we have lots of ways to treat this and this may not even be traditional acne. The other big reason for acne along the hairline would be some hats and helmets that some people wear for sports or other reasons. And if that's the case, another good reason to talk to your dermatologist because it's not that you have to not play sports. Of course you can play sports. We just like to come up with routines or regimens that are one step ahead of the game to try to prevent the breakouts from happening, treat the old ones that you have, and hopefully we can get one step ahead of it so that you don't always have to deal with the breakout afterwards. Now, acne along the nose. So say, for example, you're getting breakouts that are really, it can be in other parts of the face, but really focused on that central face along the nose. There are two major types of pimples that I tend to see in this area, and it's worth going over both because, again, not every pimple is acne. And I always like to hammer that point home because we want to get that diagnosis right because accurate diagnosis leads to better treatment options. Two major types of breakouts I see along the nose would be, yes, you can get just regular acne, if acne is the cause, what you're gonna see in the background is lots of whiteheads, blackheads, this would be clogged pores, open and closed comedones that can get inflamed or cystic at times, and they'll be really based around a pore. So you will see that clogged pore at the center, and then the breakout will happen from there. Now, another big cause of breakouts around the nose would be rosacea. Now you can get breakouts with rosacea, but these might be a little different, but fool you into thinking that they're regular acne. A lot of times these will be red inflamed papules or bumps, maybe starting off as flushing or blushing initially, but then progresses into what looks like a breakout, but they'll be different, meaning they won't be based around a pore or a clogged pore. These will be really inflamed. You might think you can go to pop one, but you really can't. They're really under the surface. And if you did try to squeeze one, you're not going to get that satisfaction of popping a pimple or getting any pus or those that cheesy white stuff out of a, an acne type of pore. You might just get clear fluid. And then ironically, it might get worse. It might actually get more inflamed or more uncomfortable. Rosacea is a different category of breakout that we'll talk about in other videos. 
And if that's the case, you're gonna notice in the background that maybe you have some clogged pores, but the primary lesion, the primary spot that's inflamed is not truly a clogged pore. And discerning between the two is important because a lot of acne products will actually make rosacea a little worse. So we like to get that diagnosis correct because then you're gonna find yourself in this cycle of things just getting really inflamed, dried out, but not better. And we don't like to see people in that never ending cycle because that can get very uncomfortable and very unsightly because it's right at the center of the face and you wanna reduce that inflammation so it's not quite so uncomfortable. The other big cause for breakouts around the nose would be something called Staphylococcus, which is a bacteria that can take up residence inside the anterior nares or the inner nostrils of the nose. When this happens, you can get breakouts around the nose that can be red, inflamed, and pustular. They can actually have a lot of inflammation within them, and some people can actually even get breakouts inside of the nose, which are very uncomfortable. So this is something that if you find that your breakouts are particularly painful, sore, tender, they're inside the nose, they're around the nose, maybe even along the upper lip, especially if you shave and you start to get all of these little pus bumps in the areas that you shave, please talk to your dermatologist because we often do need to treat this with antibiotics by mouth because the bacteria can spread as well and we don't want that to get out of control. Now let's move on to acne along the cheeks. Now the cheeks is interesting because a lot of companies have taken up marketing to say that acne on your cheeks is from your pillowcases. And this, I have to dispel this because I even have colleagues that have jumped on this kind of concept of getting silk pillowcases. Now remember, there are not a lot of studies to support this, but the study that a lot of companies and people will reference was a study that was not silk pillowcases, but silk-like pillowcases. There was a study with silk pillowcases, but it was not traditional silk that you buy from any store. It was a different type of textile that was produced by a company that is really focused in on textiles for skincare. Very different element altogether. So I don't think we can jump on this idea of just getting silk because silk is a very difficult textile to manage. You have to keep it clean in a certain way um, and it has to be hand washed and laid out flat to dry. Most teenagers cannot do this consistently. I raised three kids and I can tell you none of them would have been capable of doing that. And the last thing I wanna do is add to the rigor of your day-to-day -day routine. Silk-like pillowcases basically means anything that smooths to the touch because ultimately when textiles interact with the skin, the theory or concept behind breakouts triggered by your pillowcases would not be based on there being some sort of bacteria that jumps into your skin from your pillowcase. We'll talk about that in a second in terms of laundering and keeping things clean. But most of it's based on the friction coefficient of the textile against your skin. So when people talk about silk with pillowcases, it's not the silk itself that we're referencing. It's actually just the texture and feel of the pillowcase. So anything that is smooth texture, that is soft against your skin and does not trigger inflammation or irritation from rubbing against it would be sufficient. This can be from cotton. It can be from sateen, which is also cotton. It can be from polyester blends, cotton blends, anything's fine as long as it's smooth to the touch, which would also mean avoiding fabrics and pillowcases and textiles that are embroidered or have some added friction as a result of the embroidery. Also remembering that how you maintain your fabrics is also essential because it's not that silk is not gonna allow bacteria to overgrow or these other things I tend to hear in marketing. It's just that basically if you can keep your textiles clear, being laundering them routinely once a week usually is sufficient for pillowcases. More routinely, if you're using lots of products before you go to bed where the residues of those products could really build up in the pillowcase, or say, for example, you tend to sweat a lot at night, or there's other factors that we have to play, take into consideration. And those cases may be laundering more frequently, but also recognizing how you launder matters. You know, I wanna make sure that you're maintaining your textiles in the best shape possible. Means putting them through the laundry machine, not overloading the laundry machine, letting the garments move around freely so that actually they can release the buildup of oil, dirt, and debris 
the water can take it out and it's not that it's kind of trapped on other clothing items. Using a fabric rinse is really helpful in these cases. These are products that you add to the fabric softener drawer and they come out during the rinse cycle only because what they do is really lift out added residues that are in fabrics. Because remember, if you're using lots of acne products or other skincare products, before you go to bed, those are accumulating in your pillowcase as well. And that's only going to contribute to irritation to your skin potentially over time or serve as an area for bacteria and yeast to actually latch onto in the pillowcase that can climb into your skin too. So all of those things do matter, but silk itself is not going to stop that stuff. And actually, if you're using lots of skincare products and sleeping on a silk pillowcase, you're going to feel a difference in the texture of that silk where it's not going to feel like silk anymore over time. And if you don't maintain it appropriately, it will also start to change its texture. And ultimately, it's the texture that matters, not the actual fiber that you made the pillowcase out of. So please stop wasting your money on silk pillowcases, especially for teenagers, because I want you to maintain them the right way and not go overboard in terms of having to add as another step to your weekly or daily routine in terms of laundering them the right way. So when it comes to acne along the cheeks, why is it along the cheeks? There's a good chance that because the cheeks are a hormonal area, meaning this is the beard distribution of our skin, this is where most of our androgen receptors are, there's a better chance than not that this is a hormonal sensitivity issue and not necessarily triggered by your pillowcases. I've also heard some people reference their phones and other friction related items against their skin. So yes, with acne mechanica, which is the direct clogging of pores from friction or irritation, there is some of this potential, but again, it's one of those things that as long as you are cleansing your skin and maintaining a good skincare routine, you should be able to reduce the impact of those items against your skin and just focusing on those products that you have prolonged contact with your skin as being soft textured, such as pillowcases, but again, not silk, any textile will do for this as long as it is smooth textured. So the chin area, when you get breakouts that are really focused in on the chin, there are a bunch of different causes for this as well. The first would be, yes, traditional acne. This is still the beard distribution. Androgen sensitivity is present there, which means your hormones will be more susceptible to triggering excess oil building up in those pores, triggering traditional acne. It's really focused in on that area that might be playing a role. However, there are a couple of other causes to consider. You might actually find that in the chin area, some people will also see excess coarse hair growth. And if that is occurring, then it's very common based on the hair removal method to trigger breakouts that are resulting from ingrown hairs or inflamed hair follicles. So waxing, plucking, shaving, sometimes what will happen is bacteria will colonize that area where the hair was removed from and trigger swelling and inflammation that can make it harder for a new hair growing out to actually make it to the surface so it'll start to ingrow. That'll become painful, sore, tender, uncomfortable, and sometimes it can leave behind discoloration when it finally does come out too. If that's the case, we don't always treat with just acne products alone. We have to really review the process of considering the role that bacteria play, as well as the hair removal method, as well as methods that we can do to reduce that tendency. And the last possibility in that area that's also possible is that sometimes people get tinea or ringworm in the beard area and that can lead to pimples or breakouts because when the ringworm or a fungus gets deep inside of our pores, it can really inflame them and lead to what looks like pimples or swelling. You will also find that it can be itchy or uncomfortable at the same time. So there can be other clues to the diagnosis based on the pattern of how it looks. Probably the most important thing to learn from the acne face map talk is that not every pimple is acne. And this is what really plagues a lot of the people that I see as patients is they will tell me that they tried to use a traditional acne spot treatment or a medication that is focused on acne and it made their breakout worse. Then we start thinking about rosacea or other reasons for worsening breakouts. Sometimes excess exfoliation, which is very common to pursue with acne, when you're trying to exfoliate or get rid of a buildup of dead skin cells on the skin, can potentially make conditions like follicular 
folliculitis for infected hair follicles or a tinea or ringworm worse and spread potentially because then it looks for areas of the skin to seed. So again, if you are finding that you are not getting better, you're just getting worse and it seems like it just doesn't add up and you've tried every product out there, I'd rather you not try every product out there before you come and see me. So try to kind of consider, is your skin responding to treatments that you've tried over the counter first effectively? If it's really not predictable and it's not working well enough, seek out a care of our dermatologists in our community only because it is important to find that if you can seek out that care, get the diagnosis correct, you'll get on that path to right, the right treatment options faster and reduce that risk of scarring and of course the discomfort that comes with breakouts as well.